Okay, well, we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order and welcome everybody to the regular meeting of the Board of Directors of Valencia's Water District on Wednesday, September 1st, 2021 at 5 p.m. I'm gonna take a moment here to read a quick notice to the public. Due to the evolving situation with COVID-19 novel coronavirus, so long as state or local public officials have imposed or recommended social distancing measures, Valacito's Water District will hold future meetings via teleconferencing and allow members of the public to observe and address the meeting telephonically or otherwise electronically. During this period of time, Valacito's Water District will not be making any physical location available for members of the public to observe the meeting and offer public comment. The public is encouraged to watch and participate in the meeting from the safety of their homes. The meeting can be viewed on the agenda page located on the main page of the district's website. Public comments or questions can be submitted to the following email address, publiccomment at vwd.org. All written comments that are received at least 90 minutes before the meeting will be provided to the board and a record of the receipt of comment will be noted during the meeting. Members of the public viewing the meeting via the Zoom video conferencing platform can express their desire to provide an input at the appropriate time by utilizing the raised hand function. Additional instructions for online participation will be posted on the district's website at www.bwd.org backslash meetings. And we'll go ahead and move on to uh, the Pledge of Allegiance this evening. Uh, Director Pinnock, would you please lead us? Sure, all right. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the, the Republic, Republic for, which for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Director Pinnock. And we'll do a roll, a roll call for attendance. Director Othart? Here. Director Boyd Hodgson? Here. Director Pinnock? Here. Director Hernandez? Here. And I am here as well. I'll entertain a motion to adopt tonight's agenda, please. Move to approve, Hernandez. Thank second, you. Thank. thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve tonight's agenda. If there's no discussion, we'll go ahead and conduct a vote. Director Hernandez? Yes. Director Boyd Hodgson? Yes. Director Pennick? Yes. Director Alathart? Yes. I vote yes as well. Motion passes unanimously. And Glenn, I know that you noted that we did not receive any public comment beforehand, but do we have anybody who wishes to speak now during public comment? I do not see any hands raised from the public. Okay, All right. we'll keep moving along. I will uh, entertain a motion to approve tonight's consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar will be voted upon by one motion. There, there will be no separate discussion of these items unless a board member or member of the public requests that, that a particular item uh, or items be removed from the consent calendar, in which case it will be considered separately under action items. Is there a motion? I'll move yeah. approve. Okay, I heard, uh, Director Boyd Hodgson um, made the motion and Director Althar made the second. Uh, so we have a motion and a second to approve tonight's consent calendar. Any further discussion or item on any items? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to a vote. Director Boyd Hodgson. Yes. Director Pennick. Yes. Director Althar. Yes. Director Hernandez. Yes. And I vote yes. Motion passes unanimously. And we're speeding right along tonight. That takes us to action items, item 2.1. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that real quick, President Snella, and then I'll hand it over to James. But uh, item 1.3 on the consent calendar tonight was that a construction agreement for the Mirai project. And item 2.1 is annexing that project into the district sewer service area. So James Gumpel will give the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President and uh, members of the board. Uh, hopefully I'm sharing my screen and I'm, I take it you can see the exhibit. We can. Mm -hmm. Great. So 
uh, this project, uh, the Mirai project, uh, has been before the board already. And just as a quick reminder, this starts on page 34 of your board packet. Uh, and the Mirai project consists of roughly 91.65 acres, and it's in located basically off of Los Postos Road. It's this map went down further. Uh, Mission is down here, and of course the uh, the ball fields and the district's uh, offices is just off to the east. Uh, where Los Postos ends currently, uh, there's two developments up here. One is got Mirai, and this that's the project that we're talking about today. They're getting, they're going to be building 89 single family units at the site. Uh, the entire project is actually within our water service boundary. However, none of the project was in our sewer service boundary. So back on October 7th of 2020, the board uh, basically approved the process for annexation uh, pending that Mirai, the developer from Mirai meet certain conditions. Those conditions are also outlined on page 34 of your board packet. Uh, the developer has met all the conditions at this point. And now uh, everything's been ready to move forward for final annexation. So of that 91.65 acres, roughly 67 and a half acres uh, is what we call developed area. That's the area that they're going to be developing roads, houses, uh, parkways, everything else that they're going to do. Uh, the remainder tw remaining 24 acres is dedicated open space. So this action tonight is going to be annexing um, 67.59 acres into the VWD sewer service boundary. Um, and the remaining 24 acres is going to remain uh, unannexed into the sewer service boundary. And of course, since it's open space, we will not be uh, providing any sewer service to that area. So uh, with that, unless there's any questions, um, all, well, first off, all payments and all conditions have been met. And with that, you know, staff recommends adoption of the resolution recognizing the annexation of 67.59 acres of the Mirai residential development into the Valsius Water District and ordering the annexation of that 67.59 acres into sewer district improvement uh, one, two, and six. I'd be happy to at least attempt to answer any questions if the board has them. Thank you, James. Uh, do any of the board members have any questions? I'd see heads shaking. No, I do not see any hands. Any uh, any uh, public speakers on this one, Glenn? Um, I don't see any. Okay, then I will nope. entertain. I'll entertain a motion if uh, there's no discussion. I'll move staff's recommendation. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Director Pennick. We have a Motion and a second to move staff's recommendation on item 2.1. Conduct a roll call vote. Director Pennick? Yes. Director Elitharp? Yes. Director Hernandez? Yes. Director Boyd Hodgson? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, James. Thank you, James. That takes us to item 2.2. Uh, the approval of uh, construction agreement amendment for the waiver of the full property line frontage sewer main extension. Yeah, so back on uh, August 18th at our last board meeting, the board heard a presentation regarding a request basically from a developer to waive a condition of the construction agreement. So I think James, you're gonna handle this item as well, right? Yep. Okay, I'll share my uh, screen, which basically just shows the map of what we're talking about. So that 200 Leo, 203 Leo feet off Woodward is this piece right here between the two arrows. Uh, the Mission Villas development is actually going to be constructing sewer basically from its frontage off of Woodward down into Mission to connect to our existing sewer line. Uh, this item was brought to the board at the last meeting, and so I'll just go over a brief uh, history of where we are. So uh, as the board may recall, uh, with our practices and considering there's the residential share of property that could benefit from it, we conditioned this development to move uh, to construct 203 lineal feet. Uh, the developer, which is KB Homes, uh, felt that that wasn't necessary for several reasons. Staff actually is in agreement with KB Homes that if the pipe is not going to be utilized, there's no reason to build it. So staff came up with a few different options working with KB. One option that staff came up with was doing a, a in lieu payment, which limits its district's liability. That in lieu payment was roughly $70,000 as estimated by KB's, uh, KB's engineer. 
for the 203 feet plus another $25,000 roughly for uh, the actual rock that they would encounter. So a total of 105,000. KB recommended trying to get an agreement with Reza Shara saying that they're, they're most likely going to Seward North, which they have that option. Um, the uh, agreement, unfortunately, uh, also, the agreement also relieves any liability for the district in the future, but unfortunately the agreement was not able to be completed. Uh, that being said, this item was brought to the board at the last board meeting to discuss the different options. Uh, staff is in agreement that constructing the line itself doesn't make sense, especially if it's not going to get used. Uh, board's direction uh, from the last board meeting on 18s was to bring this back uh, for consideration of waiver uh, of the 203 lineal feet. Uh, so with that, uh, staff recommends authorization of the general manager to execute the amended amendment to the construction agreement for Mission Villas project, waiving approximately 203 lineal feet of full frontage sewer main line extension on Woodward Street. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, at this point. Thank you again, James. Are there any questions? I see one hand, Director Boyd Hodgson. Thank you. Thanks, James, for your work on this. Um, just reminds me, I know that the original staff recommendation was to hold some money essentially in escrow to limit uh, the potential liability. Is that also part of the option or is that option no longer part of uh, the deal that we're voting on tonight? Uh, Director Boyd Hodgins, the deal that is presented is just a, a full waiver for the 203 lineal feet uh, for the developer. So at this point, the recommendation is to remove this from the construction agreement and uh, not go forward with the in lieu cash. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any hands. Any uh, any hands up in the uh, in the public audience? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Um, okay, if there's no other discussion, I'll entertain um, a motion. Move to approve, Hernandez. Thank you. I'll, I'll second it, uh, Sonella. So we have a motion um, to approve uh, or authorize the general manager to execute an amended construction agreement for the Mission Villas project. A motion by Hernandez, second by Sonella. We'll go ahead and connect or conduct a, uh, a roll call vote. Director Hernandez. Yes. Director Pinnock. Yes. Director Boyd Hodgson. Um, I would have preferred that we held the uh, the money in escrow to prevent our liability. So I'm going to say no. Uh, Director Althart. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Uh, motion passes four to one. And thank, you. thank you. Moving right along. Thanks, thanks, James. Um, item 2.3, uh, voting redistricting presentation. Yeah, so public agencies with elective offices are required to redraw their political boundaries every decade based on the most recent census data. So uh, James Gumpel is gonna give a, a brief presentation tonight, talk about the process that we go through. We're not looking for direction or a, a, a decision today. Uh, just we're beginning the process and we just want to give the, the, the board an overview of where we'll be going along this journey. So James, why don't you take it away? Thank you, uh, President Snilla, members of the board. I'm going to give you a brief presentation as a uh, general manager Froom uh, described. So let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, here we go. Um, so redistricting overview uh, for today's meeting. So really quick. Uh, so Redistricting and actually drawing the district division boundaries for the board member has been primarily looked at and handled by staff in the past. Um, so as far as the districting itself, the process is basically creating division boundaries. Uh, and these boundaries have a really one purpose is to basically put equal distribution or as equal as possible uh, for different divisions for the different board members and for to kind of equal out the constituents. They have no operational or any other real purpose besides that. The um, actual um, the actual criteria below is listed. I'm going to go over the criteria, but also understand we work directly with the San Diego Register of Voters. And the criteria itself, meeting one criteria actually 
uh, affects all the other criteria. So it's hard to meet every criteria exactly. So these are basically guidelines that they want you to try to meet. In a perfect world, you didn't meet all the major criteria for every time you either district or redistrict. So uh, you want basically the division to be relatively equal size for residents. So, you know, we're looking for approximately 10% between large to, to smallest divisions if possible. Uh, however, you want to maintain communities of interest, whether it's ex ethnic groups, language barrier minorities, homeowners, renters, seniors, uh, rural communities, urban communities, and basic environmental interests. A big example of that is, is uh, you know, if you have a community, so I live in San Leo Hills, for example, San Leo Hills is one big community. However, that's not the intent of it. The intent is really the smaller subdivisions in San Leo Hills. You don't want to have a situation where um, you vote for one division and your neighbor next door to you or your neighbor across the street in the in-track neighborhood votes for a different division in a different division. You also want to follow both natural and man-made barriers. So you know, obviously they're pretty obvious, uh, pretty obvious creeks, canyons, ridge lines, other natural barriers, and of course, major streets and freeways. Uh, and then you want to keep the division contiguous or compact in nature if possible. So you don't want to have uh, them separated out into do different areas or get really skinny and, and big. You want to keep, kind of keep it natural and compact if possible. As you can see from these different criteria, as you change one, they really affect the others. So redistricting basically is a periodic check-in. Is, is, are your boundaries of the division still meeting the intent of the criteria, what basically the registrar of voters and the county is looking for? And the primary drivers for Valsio's water district is really the census and growth. And I'm going to give you some examples of how that has affected us in the past. Uh, so we look at redistricting on regular intervals, at least since 2010, we look at it at regular intervals, to ensure that we're at least staying close to the criteria. And we work with the county uh, with that to see if there's a need to change as far as from a redistricting standpoint. Obviously, I already mentioned the census and we had a 2020 census and that data is coming out. When that data comes out from the census, SANDAG is the regional agency that looks at our population growth, growth and how that's distributed within our area, actually for the whole county itself, but then we actually ask for our specific boundaries. We also have uh, other information directly from the registrar of voters to basically match up with the SANDAG information. And then although it's not possible, uh, when you redistrict, you wanna strongly consider not moving voter groups in and out of different divisions. Uh, it's nearly impossible to do so, but an example of this is, is our board is elected for four-year terms. However, elections happen every two years, so you can look at redistricting practices up to every two years if appropriate. So there is a chance whenever you redistrict that a uh, constituent who voted for a board member just two years ago could, could get moved into a new board member's division. So, uh, and, and when I show you the maps, it'll be pretty obvious how that happens. It's, it's really unavoidable unless, um, unless you just get lucky and the, you're moving the constituents from one four-year term to another four-year term at the end of a term. Uh, but a lot of things have to line up for that to happen. So, Redistricting process as far as Valcidos, it's fairly straightforward. So we get the most recent census data and then we wait for SANDEG population growth numbers. We get it specific for our boundaries and we overlay it with the uh, data that we get directly from the uh, registrar voters on voting precincts. Uh, we put that into our geographical information system, our GIS software. Our GIS software gets that information electronically both from the San Diego Registrar of Voters and from SANDAG. So we could populate that electronically into our mapping systems. And then it actually has a, a, um, an add-on or a software. Uh, um, it actually has it built in where you could redistrict. You can put in the criteria that we mentioned above and it'll automatically draw out what it feels is as close as it can to meet all the criteria. From there, staff has to look at it because what the GIS doesn't know is if there's certain historical neighborhoods or certain areas of, of, of community that seem to make sense that stay together. Because it's really just looking at 
man-made boundaries, uh, natural barriers, and population numbers. And it draws out about it, but it gets pretty close. It, it does a really good job, especially in our area. Uh, so we end up at looking at that from staff. And, and, and then at that point, we end up getting an independent third-party consultant to review the criteria to make sure that staff isn't missing anything. Uh, and it's basically a third-party consulting looking at the new division boundaries that are being recommended through the redistricting process. Uh, that, those changes are then given to the general manager to forward to the board of directors for evaluation. The board is presented with the new district or division boundaries. Uh, after that, a public hearing is held to review and comment on the changes. Uh, the boundaries are let, then after public hearing is accepted by the board, pending all comments are satisfactorily addressed. And then the new districting boundaries or the new division boundaries are sent to the county registrar of voters. And at that point, they actually review it. And majority of the time it's done at that point, but it can come back uh, if they have comments in which then we have to address their comments and bring that back to both the general manager, the board, and have another public hearing if necessary. So, so here's a few kind of examples. So pre-2010, I call pre-2010 because I really don't know when it was done before 2010. Uh, my, I suspect that uh, the district boundaries were actually accomplished probably after the, the 2000 census data, so maybe in 2001 or 2002 at the latest, and they weren't changed. So you could see from here, there's a huge disparity in population distribution uh, pre-2010, because it was probably done in 2001 or 2002. And Division 5, which includes the San Luis area, saw tremendous growth in the early 2000s. So this makes sense. Um, so then the first one that staff did, at least since uh, my tenure here at the district, was in 2012. And we basically tried to even out the distributions. And we could see the movement that we did. We assigned uh, to Division 1 from Division 2. This one went to Division 5 from Division 4. Here was an assignment to Division 5 from Division 2 and assigned to Division 3 from, the, from Division 5. Sorry, it's a mouthful to say all that. Uh, and so this was an attempt to kind of keep general communities together and, and also even out the population distribution and still try and meet those natural barriers of, between uh, you know, ridge lines, lakes, creeks, major arterial roads. So again, in 2016, we looked at that. We looked at redistricting and we looked at the distribution. We actually worked with the county registrar of voters at that point, and there was no triggers for, uh, for redistricting prior to the 2016 uh, election cycle. And then for 2021, we're waiting for the new census data. So you kind of see the process that we went through in the past. This is the process and the, uh, and the uh, steps that we take moving forward. Obviously, we're expecting the new SANDAG information for the census data to be available, hopefully sometime by mid to end of September. At that point, we need to start moving forward as there's a deadline for us to get all the information back into the county registrar of voters. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, James. Director Boyd Hudson. Thank you. Thanks again, James, for your work on this. That was a really thorough presentation. I do have a question. Um, the, the redistricting process at higher levels of um, sort of government and input, there is an opportunity for communities of input to provide their input before the first draft of the maps. Is that going to be the case with Viacitos? Uh, so historically in the past, it, it hasn't, but anything is possible as far as re community reach out. Uh, being a water district, uh, the amount of input that we usually get is pretty minimal uh, in the past. Uh, however, it doesn't mean it's going to be minimal every time. Thank you. James, did I hear either, um, it was either in your presentation or maybe I read it somewhere, but in the packet, but there's, isn't there going to be a public workshop at some point? Yeah, I'll just go back to the process just, just so we have it up, up. So here's the process. And there's I, the, the public hearing process is actually a two-step process. So even it, it's a once to present it, 
to the community. And then the second one is the public hearing. And so there's two opportunities for the public to get involved and actually comment on the redistricting process. Both opportunities to public during that time, public comments can be received. And there is you know, a requirement to at least evaluate and address those public comments too, depending on what the nature of the comments are. And President Sanella, it may be a good opportunity for General Counsel Gilpin to weigh in on any of the specifics. Again, this was intended to be kind of a broad overview, not every specific detail, but we want to make sure we're heading in the right path and we're all on the same page. So, Mr. Gilpin, is there anything you'd like to add about the process? No, I think this is the process that has been used in the past, but it's up to the board to decide the process it wants to follow. I mean, this is the general process that's followed by most water districts with the exception of, I don't think you have retained a de demographer in the past. Uh, James, that may be the consultant you're referencing, but there is an opportunity for the public to comment on the proposed redistricting proposed by staff or the board before the board would adopt it. And uh, Mr. Gilpin, I think the timeline was, was April. Do we have to have this all wrapped up by? I think your date's been accelerated to March, Glenn. Has it been? At the last meeting. Um, it was previously. Oh, that's right. It was usually uh, so many days before the election, but they moved it ahead of that. They, they moved it up to March. Uh, I think we just had the, a breakout session I think it was uh, April 11th, if I remember correctly. But I defer to. I think that was something that was April 17th, but that was I think that was a different deadline. For or was a, it for a different item? Oh, yeah. But it's it needs to be completed by the end of Q1, right? I mean, yeah, and and, and we'll we'll meet all those timelines, and uh, as when we get the data and we start doing some of the analysis, we'll come back to the board and show you. The results of some of the preliminary analysis so, so you know where we're heading. I'd, I'd kind of more of a historical question, James. You know, you talked a little bit about um, kind of dividing up communities or neighborhoods and um, obviously th this is the first time I've gone through, I think any of the board members have gone through this uh, with Valacitos. And what, what's the history of the background on um, dividing up Lake San Marcos? So um, that's a good question. And I don't have a complete answer for you, President Sinella. So previous to 2010, uh, Lake San Marcos community was already uh, divided up between uh, the two divisions down here. Um, so that remained historical. I can't find any information as far as in our archives of how the 2001 or 2000, basically from the 2000 census, what occurred or what occurred before that. So there's no information I could find. So unfortunately, I don't really have a good answer for you. I know they used a lake primarily as a, a divider. And if you look at the way the lake is separated, a lot of times on the western side of the lake, there's a lot of senior housing and more high density, while on the eastern side of the lake, it's more, uh, more single family units. Uh, but I, I, I'm actually just guessing based on knowing what I know about the community. I don't know if that was actually the decision process at the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gilpin, you have your hand up? Yeah, I just looked and I was wrong. Uh, it is April 17th, so Director um, Hernandez was right from his presentation. They moved it from May. I had reversed it in my mind. I know they moved it 30 days, but it's now April 17th is the deadline. Way to go, Director Hernandez, taking, taking back some stuff already, paying off dividends for the uh, the conference. Thank you. Well, actually, it was uh, Director Pinnock that had the right date. I had the right oh, okay. But I'll give well, credit to the right. He doesn't, well even take, he doesn't even take notes. He just takes mental notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done to both of you. That, that's, why, yeah. that, that's why we go, right, to, to yeah. learn. Um, okay. A any other uh, questions or um, comments uh, from uh, the board? I guess the only thing I, I would just, you know, if you can go to the next slide, James, and I know these numbers are the, the next one. There you go. So just looking at the, um, like the, two, the 2016, which was five years ago, 
Um, if, if all we are looking at is essentially keeping the, and uh, I, I, let me ask you this, is this, is this population or is this registered voters? This is, po this, this is population. So the way okay. they do it ba is based on population. We overlay that with the voting precinct numbers, but even the voting precinct numbers give you population numbers. They don't, they don't line up with the Sandag numbers. So it's a little frustrating. So we have to, we have to, and that's a lot of the work that staff has to do because the voting precinct population number and the sanding numbers come from two different uh, sources and they're, they're put together different ways. But so we, we have to kind of rectify that uh, through the program. And that's the majority of the time, to be honest, that's the majority of the time staff has to spend on it. And this, that's the majority of the work that's done on it. Everything else is 80%, 90% done by the computer. It sounds like the from your um, the re, the criteria that it's the the main purpose of this is just to ensure that the districts are, you know, they're all close to each other in population, right? And and they were in 2016. Now we know that there's been some growth throughout the city, the city, but my guess is is that, you know, the 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 boundaries may be massaged a little bit to keep everybody around that that you know 20,000 mark or that 20 21,000 mark. Um, but I can't imagine that there's going to be, you know, we're not that big of a, of a service area, right? So maybe we've had a population growth of 20,000 total. You divide that by five, you know, it's, um, there's not, you know, we're not talking about massive numbers here. What are those little red marks on the map? Uh, those are just some of the larger annexations that came in around 2016. Uh, they, they really just represent, you know, probably another 30 people to 50 people within that division boundary that wasn't okay. there uh, prior to that. So it, it really didn't make any difference. That's why there was no uh, there was no changes when we looked at the boundaries with the registrar of voters in 2016. There was, yeah, there Division one is pretty rural. The, the high density housing is all built in and yeah. mostly mostly five. So three is a high density area going across, and that represents kind of the valley, uh, you, know, you know, along the freeway corridor. Yeah, that's uh, cool. ob yeah. ob obviously five is, is on the western side. It's it's a fairly high density going down. So, oh, sorry, four and then five is is a lot of new growth in five, relative new growth in the two thousands. Oh, yeah. When, did, when, was, when was Old Creek Ranch built? Because they're they're in four, but they're uh, but they've been there for a while, haven't they? They've been there, but definitely before sixteen. So, and there's there's been yeah. nothing new really there. And then that that corner of Carlsbad that's in four, that's all been there for at least a, a couple decades. So, um, I don't think there's been a lot of construction in that area. The majority of the growth we expect is Rancho Tesoro area along the college uh, and basically along the corridor along the college area is probably the majority of the new growth. But the yeah. census data uh, is that's only part of the equation there, you know, there's there's normal population growth from birth rates and people moving in yep. uh, along with just pure growth itself. So the census data will hopefully it should account for both. But I suspect it's going to make sense where the population growth are based on where the new developments happen, you know, post 2016. Okay. So what's, what's your next steps? Uh, so for staff, we're hoping to get the census data sometime in September or by the end of September from Sandag. Uh, census data is out, but the Sandag hasn't uh, put that data into different groupings that we could specifically get it for our area. We've already requested that from Sandeg, so we're, we're just in the queue, so to speak. Once we get that information, we're going to follow the steps uh, as outlined here, unless there's some other direction. So we're going to go ahead and, and put that input into our ArcGIS software, start working on rectifying those population differences uh, and double checking those. And then basically start looking at, uh, you know, are, is the computer dividing up historical neighborhoods or doing something that doesn't make sense? At that point, we'll start working with the general manager and also getting a consultant on board to actually, you know, do a double check for us and look at, you know, if there needs to be further adjustment. And then, of course, get the board gets the board involvement starts around that time. Yeah, President Snella and members of the board, I think the first thing we'll do is take all that data that we get from the county and from Sandeg 
and drop it into our existing boundaries. And then we can provide you with an updated chart on the bottom right of the screen you see here where it says TBD. So if we didn't change the division boundaries at all based on new data, what would the population numbers be? And that's where our starting point is. If it comes out and it's miraculously, they're all you know, within a couple of percent of each other, maybe we don't need to redistrict at all, or maybe we do. My guess is that there'll be enough differences to dictate that you need to change some boundaries in some locations to even out the, uh, the population in each of the divisions. Okay, thank you. Director Boyd Hodgson. Thank you. I would like to propose, um, can, you, can you put up the slide again with the, the bullet points of the process? Thank you. I would like to propose that a community of, in, of interest uh, input session be included in maybe, um, let's see, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this list before the, uh, the first draft of the maps are drawn. And, you know, perhaps we won't get any input, but maybe we will. I just think it's important to allow the community to have a say um, since this is their, you know, these are their boundaries and we represent them. So I'd like to see that added prior to the first release of the, the maps being drawn. And maybe we can decide, you know, maybe it's like a, a two week period of time where they can submit their, um, their input or three weeks. I'm not sure what it should be, but I would like to see that in this process. Director Boyd Hodgson, if I can get some clarity. So you, you mentioned uh, getting the communities of interest involved. Does, mm -hmm. does that mean everybody gets a chance or specific? are we targeting specific groups that would be invited to this meeting? I think communities of interest can be de de defined uh, broadly. Um, you know, in other areas that I've been involved in, it is a form that's submitted. And maybe it's that simple. Maybe it's if somebody wants to define their community, they fill out a form. Um, I think the um, I think there is a standardized form that's available. Maybe we use that form rather than having to recreate something. Maybe they just fill out a form and say, "My community is, you know, it's defined by these streets because um, you know I shop here and I you know I use this healthcare center or something like that." I just want to have the opportunity for people to to provide that input if they want. Maybe we won't get anybody, um, but but maybe we will, and that might also offer some, uh, you know, some important information and insight for us. Um, you know, communities that have sprung up. You know, maybe there's a, a concentration of um, Ethiopian community that we you know maybe we hadn't thought of, and maybe that's they want to stay together. So I just think it's important to provide uh, the opportunity for the input. Whether or not we get any, that's another story. But at least providing the opportunity before we release the maps to the public, because it's always you know, it's, it's, it's good to begin with the end in mind, right? So if we have that input before we define those boundaries, um, then something like that can be respected. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, there's, I'm kind of surprised it wasn't part of it. Maybe I was just confused because I, I saw the public hearings, but uh, to, to do something or to get some input earlier on in the process sounds like a good idea to me. If you're looking for consensus staff, uh, I think um, that's fine. I think Mr. Gilpin uh, wants to yep. chime in here. Glenn, I just suggest this is an information item on the agenda tonight. Perhaps you bring back at the next meeting your proposed process for moving this forward, taking the input from the board, and then the board could actually see what the steps in the process are that you're recommending. And then they could take action on that item since this is only an information item. Okay. So, so um, General Manager Prum, if I kind of uh, put a little bit more detail on this process, uh, basically slide, uh, and this way we could kind of outline each item a little bit more and then bring that back for the board's consideration, would that be acceptable? Yeah, maybe the board can then formally approve the process and then staff would diligently pursue the process. And, and try to, to the best that you're able to, James, try to put in um, dates, you know, it doesn't have to be the exact date, but like, you know, during some, we're, the goal would be during this week to do, to do this or whatever, or during this meeting to do that. So that way we have a, we can kind of see the timeline. So I could, I could try and put in a timeline because uh, uh, for me to put in actual dates, I'll have to know when the sandbag information is released. So what yep. I'll probably do is start with 
you know, week zero or month zero when we get this timeline and then just add weeks or months, however is appropriate. Would that be acceptable to you, uh, President Sonnell? Yep, works for me. Yep. I just raised my own hand. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. Um, I was looking, I was trying to pull up the public to see if there was any hands up and then I, I raised my own hand. Okay, um, cool. Any, anything else before we move on? Okay, thanks, thanks again, James. Thank you. Well, that concludes our action items tonight. We'll move on to reports. General Manager. Yeah, so as uh, uh, General Counsel Gilpin mentioned at our last meeting, the state has put together a program to help people who have fallen behind on their utility bills. And this program is called the Arrearages Program, and it is intended to help with water and wastewater bills. Uh, Viacito staff did attend a workshop on August 19th and is in the process of applying to be eligible to receive funding. And maybe I'll just give the board a few highlights. Uh, the board did ask for an update at a future meeting, and that's why I'm giving it right here. So some of the highlights, uh, $985 million was set aside for water and wastewater overdue bills. Um, the program starts with the water bills, and if there's any remaining funds at the end of that, uh, the state will repeat the process for wastewater bills. So it's possible there won't be any money left over for wastewater. Uh, the program covers the period of time from March 2020 to June 2021. Accounts must be more than 60 days past due to be eligible, and only residential and commercial customers are eligible, which means agricultural and irrigation customers are not eligible. Uh, that's not a Viacitos requirement, that's the state that set that requirement out there. Um, we are not eligible to go after uh, funding for late fees, so we have to deduct any late fees on the bills when we submit our request for funding. So this program is not between the state and individual customers, it's going to be between the state and the water and wastewater districts, so for example, Viacitos. So any money received by the districts will be credited to eligible customer accounts lowering or eliminating their balances on their overdue accounts. Uh, uh, eligible districts must, uh, they must prioritize the accounts by the size of the past due balances and place them in tiers with the higher balances receiving consideration for funding first. All customers in a higher tier must receive credits before a district can credit accounts in lower tiers. If the district does not have sufficient funds to address all eligible past due amounts, then the funds will be allocated in proportion to the outstanding balances for the people in those tiers. And uh, any customers with remaining balances after we've applied these credits must be offered a payment plan. Customers that are on a payment plan cannot have their services cut off unless they fail to comply with the terms of the payment plan. And there's some specifics about how long the payment plan can be and what the details are. And this is not intended to be all the details, just in general, there's protections for the customers. So uh, I'll call it the strings attached, right? If, if the district wants to participate in this, in this program, they have to agree to not shut customers off if they're complying with the terms of the payment plans. Uh, in order to qualify for assistance, uh, we do have to complete a survey by September 10th. Um, we're in the process of doing that and staff will continue to monitor the details of the plan and we'll we will respond by the, to the survey by the deadline. And I'll provide updates to the board as the program progresses. Um, and, you know, hard to tell if there will be any money for the, for the wastewater, but uh, we'll, we'll go through the water and then the state will tell us if there's uh, remaining funds. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah. Um... Sounds like, I know there's more details to come, but those, those strings that you had mentioned, um, they sound pretty reasonable to me. Definitely still worthwhile to, um, to pursue okay. uh, the, the money, so. And that's all I had tonight. Thank you. Just a quick question. Yes, Dr. Penick. So my understanding, the, uh, I mean, we submit all that, but the reimbursement of those funds, I understand is, could be months, like six, eight, 10 months down the road, right? Yeah, probably not that long. And they're looking to actually start dispersing funds, I think, in January. Um, they're hoping to go by the end of the calendar year. They're hoping to have uh, all the math done, right? Figure out how many people submitted, um, what's the total amount of requests, how much money can they allocate, and then apportion it to all the agencies. And then the, the plan is 
early in, uh, I believe it's early in next calendar year to start dispersing funds. And when we receive the funds, that starts a clock on Biocitos. I think we have 60 days upon receipt of the funds to apply those credits to the customers. And do we have, I mean, is there a benefit in us submitting that request sooner than later? I don't think so. I think they have deadlines and they just want to make sure. So if you miss the deadline, you're out of the program, right? But if you meet the deadline, then they'll kind of disappear. Uh, the state will, and they'll kind of crunch through the numbers of all the requests they've gotten. So the, there's, in everything I've heard, there's no uh, no priority or precedence. If you get in early, it doesn't mean you're more likely to get funding. First come, first serve type yeah, of thing. Yeah, so if, if in the water side, if they receive more than $985 million, they'll have to figure out how to apportion it in a prorated way, right? Okay, that's what I was they, wondering. They may choose to give it to uh, communities that are more disadvantaged. We, I don't know all the criteria the state may use to determine how to allocate the funds to the to the uh, local districts. But once the district gets money, then we have a better understanding of what we need to do once we have that money. Gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Mr. Gopin. I should have talked to Glenn before. The only update I had was on the deadline. And this is the first hard deadline on the program. It is September 10th. And so if an agency misses that deadline, it won't be eligible. Um, so at that point, I think the state will have a handle on after they get the surveys, um, kind of the magnitude of what they're looking at. But that's all, all right. I have. And, okay. and just so you know, September 10th is my birthday. So if you want any uh, shopping <laughs> ideas, just let me know. Is that doable? I mean, September 10th to submit that? Yeah, it is. It's a it's a okay. pretty there's a lot of data details and data to put together, but Wes and his team are putting together the numbers and, and we'll make the we'll make the deadline. The state's offered any assistance that the agencies need to help uh, submit the data. So we'll we'll get there. Cool. Okay. Uh, moving on to the uh, San Diego County Water Authority. Mr. Althart. Yeah, thank you, President Snell. Uh, the Water Authority held their regular board meeting on August 26. It was a pretty routine meeting, just a, a couple items of note. Uh, one, one item was the board authorized the general manager to execute an agreement between the Water Authority, Coachella Valley Water District and the San Luis Rey River Indian Water Authority for cost sharing of activities related to the design and environmental review of the potential Coachella Mid-Canal Storage Project Phase 1 for an amount not to exceed $305,000. Uh, the other item of note, uh, the board authorized the general manager to execute two 24-month contracts for regional communications and outreach services, one with uh, Katz and Associates for a total contract amount of $360,000, and another contract with Southwest Strategies for a total contract amount of $120,000. That's my report. Thank you, Director Althart. Encino Wastewater Authority. Uh, Jim, you got a, you want to report out on the board? I think most of it was in closed session. Uh, uh, yeah, um, a, an update on the uh, general manager uh, ad hoc committee. Uh, we've hired the consultant. The consultant has sent out uh, uh, the preliminary criteria for the board to look at, they returned their comments. The new final criteria just was delivered to me yesterday and uh, we're moving forward with uh, uh, now uh, putting that out and for applications to come in and we're on the process uh, to uh, hire a new manager. I um, like I mentioned, most of it was in closed session, so we're limited to um, speaking about details, but uh, there's more to come. Yep. And that, that was the major by far the majority of the meeting. Okay, moving on to um, item 3.5, standing committees. Uh, the finance committee did meet, but I'll, I'll, I can wait and if anybody else wants to go or I, or I can go. Did any other committees meet? Okay. The finance committee met last week. And pull up my notes here. We actually had a pretty heavy agenda, so bear with me. Um, hope I don't put you guys to sleep. Uh, first item we talked about was the, uh, the scholarship program that I think uh, Director Hernandez brought it up, um, something he, he learned a little bit about during one of his recent conferences. 
and uh, and asked for us to uh, kind of explore it. And so staff brought it to the finance committee first because obviously there's a um, there's a financial component to a scholarship program. Uh, uh, Director Boyd Hodgson and I seem to be um, aligned with that. It, you know, we think it's a good idea, and uh, and that we um, should have uh, it. You know, kind of carved out and hashed out um, in more detail with the policy uh, committee. And so, uh, so we're going to the finance committee is going to turn it over to the policy committee. And then once we get to the part about the money, then maybe you'll come back to the finance committee. If I missed anything, Director Boyd Hodgson, please uh, feel free to, to to add anything that I might have missed. Uh, the second thing we talked about was the bill payment plans and shutoffs that that essentially was kind of getting a, um, a little briefing on what Glenn just reported on. And I don't think there was anything other than what Glenn um, had to say just now. And uh, oh no, I, I take that back. The uh, the bill payment plans and shutoffs, the, the item number three was what Glenn was talking about. The payment plans and shutoffs was essentially just... Remind me, Glenn, was that an update of, of where we are and, and, uh, and you know, kind of getting the feeling is, is do you, do we want to continue it or not, not continue it, if I remember correctly? Yeah, that's exactly right. So it, uh, remember, the uh, Biocitos actually suspended shutoffs before the state did, but then the state came in and they set a deadline, and I think it's September 30th. Um, so unless it gets oh, extended right. after September 30th, Biocitos will have the ability to shut customers off for non-payment. Um, obviously, with this changing COVID environment, that may be extended. And when you look at the ongoing, this developing arrearages program, the board may want to consider holding off on shutting people off until we figured out that arrearages program. So we can bring something back to the board, maybe at the next meeting, so that it'll be before the uh, September 30th um, um, deadline for the governor's uh, moratorium. Yep, please do. And then we talked about the timing of uh, collection of the capacity fees and had a, a deep dive uh, by Wes and the finance team on that. And I, my understanding, that's also going to come to the full board in the future, Glenn. Yes. And then uh, the finance team also presented us um, an, a potential opportunity to uh, refinance some debt from 2015 at low at the current lower rates today, and there could be a potential cost savings. So they're looking into that, and they gave us an update on it. And then uh, the cost of service uh, study update, which uh, is going to be coming to all of us here uh, in the near future. So we got a, a little briefing on that as well, and and kind of you know what that process is going to look like. That was the finance meeting, finance committee meeting. Okay, moving on. Uh, director's reports on meetings, conferences, and seminars. Anybody want to go? Uh, I, I need to pull mine up. So if anybody wants to go uh, while I'm doing that. Learning a lot at CSDA. And I will say <laughs> all of that information for a concise report. I will consolidate it and present it the next time. Awesome. Thank you. I went to the... CSDA meeting in San Diego on August 19th. This is that um, quarterly dinner that they do and they always have a um, an, kind of an educational component to it. We had a, uh, a phenomenal presentation by Alex Tardy, who is with NOAA, National Weather Service in San Diego. And I've seen Alex present before over the years, and he's not only um, a very smart guy, um, but he, he has uh, a really good ability to, um, when he's presenting weather data, uh, to do it in a way that is, uh, is you know, a bit entertaining. And it's fun, he's, fun to, he's fun to listen to, even though he's presenting some pretty uh, dire information, especially when it comes to global warming and, and some of the things that we're we're going through. And uh, um, I don't think that, you know, there's any surprises, but he's, he warned us that, you know, the temperatures are still rising. I think kind of, you know, and, and I already knew that, but what I didn't realize is he spent a lot of time on the ocean temperatures and not just, not just the, the weather and the air temperatures. And, um, and I, I don't think I was as uh, knowledgeable about what was going on in, in our oceans uh, uh, as, as maybe I should have been. And it's pretty interesting. So um uh, you know, he, he didn't tell us what we need to do to, to stop 
the <laughs> if it, if there's a, if there is anything that we can be that can be done really to to prevent it from happening. But um, he, he definitely told us that um, what they're observing is uh, is is true and it's happening. And what's interesting, the one thing he said is, you know, they'll get calls because there'll be one really bad, you know, blizzard or storm um, at somewhere in um, you know in the country, and people will go see. You know that the, the, and it'll be that maybe it's uh, uh, you know an uncharacteristic time of year for a big storm. And so they'll, it'll be like May or something and it's snowing somewhere. And you know, then, but, but he says, they're looking at data over very long periods of time, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And, and if you look at the data from that perspective and you can take out those little anomalies. And uh, it was a really great presentation. I, I, if you ever get a chance to see Alex Tardy's present on that or anything else, highly recommend it. He's, um, he's, he's a very good presenter. Any other uh, updates from anybody, Dr. Hernandez? Uh, yes, I attended the same dinner. That I would agree was very interesting. The thing that caught my ear was the uh, uh, El Nino and La Nina. Uh, people expect uh, one thing or the other, and it's not always true. Uh, La Nina is supposed to bring us more rain. It occasionally doesn't. The El Nino, not so much, and then it does. So uh, that I was quite surprised at that. So um, I still rely on uh, Farmer's Almanac for the real data. <laughs> I just, have to, just while oh. I'm up here, yep. Um, I too will wait to to uh, present, but um, just a little quick summary. Um, it's great to be here, CSDA, with the. Uh, Director Hernandez and Director Boyd Hodgins, myself. Uh, and what I'm learning just a little bit is one, we're trained now and dangerous, so be careful. <laughs> um, but one, I just, one thing is I'm learning that we're doing a lot right. Um, I'm impressed with our general manager and uh, we're doing well. Our staff is amazing. Yes, there's room for improvement and we are learning that. And I'm sure uh, the three of us will will probably present some things, but just, it's, it's just great to be a part of a great organization. Um, and, uh, you know, talking with people and certain things that they're doing and like, yeah, we, we are doing that. And we have, I think we have a really good group. We have good communication. So one thing I'm learning is yes, we have room for improvement, but we we're doing a lot, right. So thank you. Well, th thanks Dr. Perry. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, that was conferences. That's the end of reports. There's nothing on 4.1 to report out. Did, are, are there any director comments or future agenda items? I don't see any hands. With that, let's uh, let's go ahead and adjourn tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thanks still for those in the public who joined us and have a wonderful night. And for those that are still traveling, uh, safe travels and uh, have a good rest of your uh, conference. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.